So Chris uh, is, has a very long title as an inaugural Thomas and Sylvia Professor in Machine Learning uh, in Department of Linguistics and Department of Computer Science at Stanford. Uh, he's currently the director of Stanford AI Library, so CEL, and associate director of Stanford Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute, so it's HAI. And you know, he has been a pioneer in bringing neural networks into natural language processing. Um, well, he has done a number of things uh, from like so in the past two or actually more than two decades. But most recently, right, he has been primarily focusing on how to apply deep learning for natural language processing uh, with methods such as like tree recursive neural networks, globe models, uh, and also very recently on connecting that to visual understanding on like building uh, data sets such as GQA and applying neural module networks for understanding language and vision as well. So today, Chris is going to talk to us about uh, more neural symbolic, so more neural uh, symbolic concept learners. Uh, welcome, Chris. Okay, thank you very much, um, Jai Jun. Okay, I think I'm good to go and people can hear me and see my slides, correct? Yeah, it's all good? Yes, all good. Okay, great. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Chris Manning, and I'm looking forward to telling you a bit about my thoughts on more neural symbolic concept learners. Um, but first of all, thanks very much to the organizers of the tutorial. And I must admit, it's a little bit fun um, getting to speak first, and maybe I can say something slightly controversial, um, arguing for a fairly um, neural position. Some of you may know that Jeff Hinton is the great, great grandson of George Bull. Besides that showing you that he doesn't have working class roots, this perhaps provides a good yardstick for which we can measure the descent from the logic of thought down to neural representations. I take the approach of neurosymbolic AI as arguing that we should climb some distance back up this yardstick. Now, for the kind of things that we're interested in here, George Bull is really the wrong person to mention. So the approach of using um, neurosymbolic symbolic models um, for tasks like language is really much more the work of people like Richard Montague, who developed the idea that you could compositionally convert a human language sentence like what is the shape of the red object left of the sphere into a predicate calculus representation like the one in the middle. And that's essentially what the symbolic um, learners use, apart from generally people um, representing this sort of more lightweight kind of functional program where you filter objects on spheres, then you um, find things that are related by being on the left, then you filter on red ones, and then you query the shape, and you end up with the answer that it should be a cylinder. So this end of the yardstick um, contrasts um, with the other extreme, where we have very big neural nets, and we train them on, on a lot of data and ask them to somehow compute the right thing. And the really surprising thing is that much of the time they actually manage to do this. But nevertheless, there are lots of reasons to question whether current neural networks are sufficient as machines for higher level reasoning. But the general sense is that neural networks and most ML models are just these sort of big correlation engines or association machines, that they have very weak inductive bias and domain structure is in practice considerably learned by feeding in massive amounts of training data, sometimes with augmentation. Um, and most of the time they don't work very well at doing transfer to a dissimilar runtime domain or doing few shot learning. They often don't demonstrate systematic generalization or compositionality, two concepts that are canonically associated with linguistic systems, but that are starting to achieve much more prominence in machine learning. And the suggestion is that neurosymbolic machines might really help with fixing these problems. A prominent early approach to neurosymbolic AI was the neural module networks of Jacob Andreas and colleagues. So these were partially supervisual, partially differentiable models that these models made use of the strong supervision that's available in data sets like this clever data set so that a seek-to-seek -seek neural model could be built that translated 
from the natural language sentence into the kind of logical functional program that I showed before. And then in neural module networks, what happened next was that this program was used to construct a question specific neural network, which is shown here on the right hand side. So there was a collection of specialized neural modules hand built to do things like filtering, counting and comparisons, which are sort of where you're set of Lego bricks and you put together a custom structure, a program um, for the particular um, question. And then you, um, the neural network ran this program and gave the answer. Um, but neurosymbolic AI seems to be slightly more um, than just a research program. Um, lately, it also seems to have become something of a PR brand. And maybe we should be a little bit worried when things like that are starting to happen. But nevertheless, um, I'm, you know, I'm really actually very sympathetic to the neurosymbolic approach in my background. Um, much of my motivations and thinking arise from human language, not vision. And when I started working on neural models again in 2010, really the big thing I was interested in was for modeling language, what we do is have the most central fact is that language has a kind of hierarchical or recursive structure, often captured by a tree structure. And I wanted to model that. And this tree structure to any linguist is completely key to the idea that if you have a sentence like the chef that ran to the store was out of food, it's not the store that's out of food, even though the store is out of food, rather as the tree structure shows, it's the chef that is the subject of was out of food and that ran to the store is a relative cause modifying chef. So what I wanted to do was construct neurosymbolic uh, models and so in particular, um, we worked for about five years on constructing tree structured neural nets so that the representations of meaning at nodes was distributed neural representations. But for computing the meaning of larger linguistic units, we we're using a purely symbolic representation of sentence structure. And this allowed us to do kind of cool things at the time, like doing fine grained sentiment analysis of sentences. So using um, what's shown here as a tree LSTM model, a sort of tree generalization of LSTMs, the model could correctly work out that a waste is something negative, of good performances is positive. And then when the two of those get combined together, um, the result is something that is positive. However, anyone who knows the slightest thing about natural language processing in the last three years um, knows that these days models like that are nowhere to be seen. Rather, what has happened has been there's been this development of a new class of transformer models of which BERT is the most famous example, but it now has many friends and descendants. So these are very large pre-trained um, transformer models. I can't go through all the details of their structure, but just very quickly, they're trained by this very simple self-supervision objective where you mask out a few words. If you have masked out a word between judiciary committee, something report, um, and the model tries to predict those words. And the way it does it is it has these contextual word representations above each word, which are stacked above it. And then the architecture works that from the initial representation by, by linear transformations, it constructs a query, a key, and a value. Then the query is used with respect to every other word's key to work out an attention distribution. And those attention distributions then are used to do a weighted sum of the values at each position, which gives you one component of a new representation but you don't only have one attention. The idea is that there are lots of attentions that will be useful in different ways for language understanding. So you compute 12 different attentions and then you combine them together to get a new representation of the word. But again, you don't stop there. You build a deep stack of these transformer cells and eventually get highly contextualized word meanings. These models have been super successful and have um, beaten out everything else in NLP for all tasks pretty much. There are tons of examples that I could give, but very quickly, one of them um, 
the Allen AI Institute has worked for about 15 years on a flagship project of answering science exam questions. And in its origins, people believed that this would be the place to prove out um, knowledge representation and reasoning. But what has happened more recently is great results have been gotten by just doing it with BERT style systems run over questions and answers, reflecting the fact that BERT picks up by this prediction task, a huge amount of meaning of the world. So that we see that Aristo Burt, which is simply Burt trained on science books rather than Reddit, um, is then easily beating out um, the knowledge-based systems. Descendants of um, Burt, like Roberta, do even better. And while the final Aristo model is an ensemble system, you can easily see that the ensemble is barely better than Aristo Roberta does by itself. And so that's really interesting, but how does Burnt learn and what does it learn? And so we could start looking at the structure of Burnt. And so there are all of these attention heads and we can look at what they do. And well, if you look at the low level of low levels of BERT, um, some of the attention heads just spread attention around everywhere and sort of like act like a bag of words averager. And that makes sense to initially get a sense of the sentence. Some of the heads just look to the word to the left or the right. Um, and that's sort of very simple, but that sort of makes sense because we know in language back from the old bigram models forward that the adjacent words are the single most useful thing to look at. But once you get into the BERT models, interesting things. So something we can do is look for syntax in these models. So that for the kind of syntactic trees, you can think of them as um, having the structure on the right where for each word, some other word is its head. And so then we can look at words in BERT and what, they're attending, what different heads are attending to. And we can see if some of the heads are starting to pick out the syntactic structure of sentences. And what we find is, yes, they do. So on the eighth level of BERT, we find head 10 um, is picking out the relationship between um, direct objects and the verb that they're the direct object of. Head 11 in the same layer is picking out pre-modifiers, articles, numbers, adjectives, modifying nouns. And there are other heads that pick out other kind of relationships that there are in language. Um, so that um, another interesting relation in language is that you get um, co-reference as to which words in a sentence are, are referring to the same real world entity. So here with Kim today, as she got some expert opinions on the damage to her home, all of Kim, she and her co-refer and head four of the fifth layer um, captures that with attention. It does that even when it's not a pronoun. So joining peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians, the negotiations are dot, 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 that negotiations and talks are referring um, to the same thing. And head four um, picks that up as well. Indeed, we can go somewhat further than that and um, say, well, although um, these vector representations look extremely different to tree representations, maybe by using the same kind of ideas of linear projection, we can find a syntax subspace inside the BERT representations, which directly captures the tree structure. And that's exactly what we actually find. So we can find the syntactic subspace, take out a minimum spanning tree in that syntactic subspace, and get out of it a syntactic structure of the sentence. And so what we find is that that just actually works super well. So we find that BERT, even though it was never told anything at all about the structure of human language sentences, just from this simple pre-training task, it becomes useful to understand sentence structure. And so it learns about the structure of sentences all by itself. And so once these neural models become parameter rich and flexible enough, we actually see a phase change in their behavior. They aren't simple association machines. Parts of the model specialize and parts of it do things like learning co-reference and hierarchical linguistic structure because it's useful even for this very simple closed prediction task. 
So what do we have here? We really have sort of um, two very simple but key neural tools, um, attention and using soft maxes, which gives you sort of kind of a, a soft categoricalization. Um, and between them, they seem to model soft symbolic structure in neural models extremely well. And ultimately soft structure is actually probably even the preferred thing because everything from our natural language grammars to our lives are a bit squishy. And so something that I've been very interested in is actually having this um, model structures such that you can have emergent near symbolic structure and being able to use that very successfully for both natural language understanding and reasoning. So moving back um, closer to vision, um, it's a very simple data set, but one that's been widely used to explore visual reasoning has been this clever data set um, where you have um, questions like, um, there is a purple cube that is behind a metal object left to a large ball. What material is the cube? And the correct answer that you're meant to get out is that um, the material it's made out of is rubber. So in 2018, um, Drew Hudson and I um, worked out um, this model which used a novel cell the idea of this cell was to exploit these ideas of attention and soft maxing to the full, but to provide a neural architecture that was more geared for doing something like soft symbolic reasoning. So in the max cell, there are two recurrent vectors, control and memory, and the control um, has a control state um, and it updates a new control state by extracting an instruction by doing attention over the natural language query. And then the read unit retrieves information from the image, which we schematize as a knowledge base, given the current control state and the previous memory, again, by attention over the stop at the top of a CNN stack. And then the write unit could update the memory state by merging old and new information. And so a MACnet was then, uh, uh, sequential models and you made this sequence of max cells and in particular um, when the max cells computed and wrote a new memory state they could do attention back to any of the old memory states and therefore this model had the capacity to represent an arbitrarily complex directive acyclic graph reasoning pattern such as you might see in symbolic logical reasoning and doing it all by attention in fact, the secret of this model is every part is attention. There's attention over the sentence, there's attention over the image, and then attention over past memories as it reasons. And the result was a very nice interpretable model. And so you could look at both the attention visualizations to both um, the sentence and the, and the visual scene to see what was going on. Now you got best results from Mac um, by having it reason on clever questions for six or eight steps. But here's an example where it was only given three steps to reason to keep it very easy to see for this talk. So at the first time step in both um, the vision and the language, it focuses on the teeny blue block. Then in the second um, step, it focuses on the sphere in front, which is over here. And then in the final step, it's focusing on color of matte thing to the right. And it focuses also on the visual scene, on the matte thing to the right, and it correctly answers with the color of purple. And one of the really cool things about the MacNet was because of this um, neural architecture more suited to reasoning, it was able to learn very effectively from a limited amount of data. And so while there had been other, a number of other models already that achieved very good results on Clever when trained on the full 700,000 items training set, sometimes with the functional programs of supervision, though I should have noted that Mac networks didn't use any of the functional program supervision, they learned everything by themselves as also did some other models like the film model shown in red. But the interesting thing was that if you trained the models on just 10% of the data, 70,000 examples, the MacNet already performed very well, um, whether er all of the earlier approaches before it um, performed very badly. So we felt that um, MacNets were 
in some sense, a better direction than what you found in neural module networks. So on Mac networks, there was this single Mac cell, which was universal and versatile. So it's one architecture and, um, and set of parameters for a Mac cell, and it could be trained differentially end to end and just adapt to compute different things in context. And that seems a good basis um, for flexible reasoning and this kind of attention based architecture that I've been emphasizing. In contrast, um, neural module networks make use of these specialized hand designed modules for um, clever style reasoning, each with, you know, distinct custom architectures for things like selecting and counting. It's not a general flexible architecture for reasoning. Now, of course, there's been a little bit of progress um, since um, um, Mac came out. And so in particular, um, the um, organizers of this workshop, including Jay Yun Mao, have introduced neural symbolic concept learners. And so um, an interesting thing about those is that they're much more data efficient again. Um, so note that there's a log scale on the training data here, but whereas Mac worked very well with 10% of the data, they were able to show that if you go down to 1% of the training data, um, that's not really enough for Mac to be doing anything yet, whereas the neurosymbolic concept learner is behaving um, very well. Um, so that is good. And another very good thing about the neurosymbolic concept learners, unlike neural module networks, is that they don't require the supervision of the functional programs corresponding to the language. They learn the functional programs as they go. So what helps the neurosymbolic concept learners? Well, they use bottom-up object-based visual features. So this has been explored quite a bit recently in BQA following the work of Peter Anderson and others. So effectively, you're using object recognizers which you pre-train to recognize things like spheres and cylinders and cubes. Um, and then the work is done on top of knowing what objects are in the scene. Um, then secondly, um, NSCL just actually has a provided hand-built symbolic reasoner um, that can then um, do the reasoning over functional programs. Um, so although it's not given the symbolic programs to learn from and has to derive those symbolic programs itself by doing semantic parsing following the kind of work of Luke Zettelmoyer, Percy Liang and others. Um, nevertheless, um, the semantic, the custom semantic parsing language and the ability for symbolic reasoning has again been given and is not learned. So this is not some kind of generic learner that can be applied to different problems without changes. So I think in some sense, this reminded me of what Colibert and Weston, their famous 2011 paper referred to as the temptation, that there's no doubt that using a separate pre-trained um, supervised learning system to map images to objects helps a lot. And, you know, in many ways, it's a pretty reasonable move to say, well, um, we can modularize that away and say, let's suppose there's this first stage of um, concept object learning, and then we'll build the stuff um, that we have on top of that. Um, but it takes us away from the goal of building large cognitive systems that can learn about the world from scratch. And it could turn out that it eventually is not necessary or good. Um, but nevertheless, it's sort of a compelling thing to do. And we've used this idea too. Um, but the difference in our work that I'm about to show in the last um, few minutes is that although we made use of bottom-up object recognizers, we still fully wanted to learn the reasoning that happened on top of that. Um, so we wanted to extend our work to real images, not the sort of synthetic images of Clever. And so we did that by working um, with the GQA data set, which we constructed, which was a kind of a cleaned up visual genome from my Stanford, Stanford colleagues, Ranjay Krishna and others. So we could have questions like, what color is the object the woman is holding? Where those questions are not human questions, they're synthesized um, from the scene graphs that underlie visual genome. And we see, sought to do a good job on this 
using a new model, the neural state machine. And the neural state machine made use of this idea of let's separately do bottom up concepts, object attributes and relations recognition, which was done by separate classifiers, which were pre-trained using image resources from visual genome and ImageNet. Um, so the bottom up recognizers allow us to build a probabilistic scene graph for a picture. And then our goal was to learn something that could translate from that probabilistic scene graph into um, an ability to answer questions. And again, we did it with attention-based inference somewhat similar to Mac. So very quickly um, from the picture, you were um, running object and attribute recognizers that gave you a probabilistic scene graph. I'm not showing all the bad things here, but everything has a probability attached to it. From the sentence, it was translated by a fully learned um, system that translated the sentence into a sequence of concepts for reasoning. And so what you then hope when this was um, executed, execution consisted of in a kind of a page rank style way, putting probability distributions over this graph. So you'd hope that it start at coffee maker, move right, be at a bowl, look inside it, um, see that the thing there is indeed red and return that it is an apple. Um, and so it then transverse states um, to do reasoning. Um, here's one more example. What is the tall object to the left of the bed made of? And so it, the first instruction it gets is bed. It then the next one is left and it has attention on all three objects here to the left. Then the next thing says tall. And so then it focuses its, its attention on this um, wardrobe. And then the next instruction is made and it returns an answer of wood. And so um, running on these real images, although Mac did a bit better than the bottom up networks of Peter Anderson and colleagues, it didn't work super well. And you could see that having this sort of do it working from a, a pre recognized concept layer was part of a, giving us a substantial lift that made it to such considerably better performance. Um, so the question really at popping back up to the top level is where on that yardstick we want to place ourselves. I mean, everybody, even Jan LeCun, will admit that you can't get somewhere with nothing, that there's no free lunch. You have to assume some form of inductive bias, any kind of neural net architecture, regularizer, et cetera, et cetera, um, is giving you some kind of bias. So everyone is going to build in some kind of st structural prior to hope to get models to learn in the, in the right kind of way. So the question is really where we place ourselves in this spectrum that I began the talk with. So at one end of the spectrum, we have the way in which one ought to think if one is to think at all being logic. And um, that's a quote from Frege translated. At the other end, um, we have Jeff Hinton, who I think honestly believes that if we can just build a neural net large enough, it will miraculously solve human intelligence. I think most people um, advocate a position that's somewhere between these two extremes. So neural module networks are fairly far in the symbolic direction. Neural symbolic concept learners arguably moved further in the symbolic direction because they actually use both the symbolic reasoner and um, the concepts that are given by the concept recognizer. With Mac, we were interested in moving considerably more in the neural direction and have a, a general cognitive architecture that could learn to reason in a soft attention based way. The neural state machine work actually worked, moved a bit further away from neural again, making use of a language of concepts, objects, attributes, and relations into which, which we translated both um, images and language into. Um, I still don't necessarily for sure know what is right, um, but um, my thinking of 2020, um, based largely on this enormous success that's come in natural language processing from these huge um, transformer models like BERT, is to actually be thinking 
what I should be doing is actually pushing more back down in the neural direction again. But I'm sure we'll hear different positions on this spectrum as the day progresses. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So, um, so uh, actually, we got a lot of questions for you from the chat. So um, here I um, picked two for you. So um, the first question that um, some people ask is that, um, so how did Mac or your uh, neural um, uh, state machine perform on real world data sets instead of the comparatively uh, simple clever data sets? And uh, what, are the, what do you think will be the major challenge when transferring from a simulated to real world data sets, specifically talking about the visual reasoning setting. Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so um, for Mac, it ran as is on a, a quote unquote real um, vision data set. Um, it sort of didn't work. And well, you know, we could then dispute as to, you know, what more would be needed in architecture, et cetera. Um, and so, for, that's part of what sort of inspired us to sort of say, okay, we will use bottom up um, object and attribute recognizers to give us more of a leg up. Um, but for NSM, we actually got good results. Um, so one thing we looked at was applying it to the VQA CP data set. And so this is a variant of the VQA version two data set um, where it was particularly meant to stress test where the models actually understand what they're doing. So what it did um, was sort of between the training and the test set, um, change the frequency of different object classes. Um, and so um, that you couldn't just use any kind of default prior. So then the training data, tennis was the most common sport shown, and test data skiing was the most common sport shown and things like that. Um, and so what the VQA literature had found is that current good um, VQA systems, including your module networks actually, um, basically fell apart on that data set that their performance was essentially dropped in half. And we were able to show that we, we could use our neural state machine and train it on that data set, even though that data set has no scene graphs and completely unrestricted human questions. And we could do well better, about 5% better than the best previous results that had been got on that data set. So that was a um, good example of working with real images. And uh, the, thank you. So uh, the second question I got from the listeners is that, um, uh, do you see a significant difference between the ease of learning for different languages by neural networks? For example, is, is it easier to learn Italian versus English? And uh, if it is, um, um, then uh, would it be a reasonable idea to build um, or NLP models for, for, for the easiest to learn language only and translate all text to that language only for training purposes? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, I, so I'll answer that quickly. Yeah, I mean, languages definitely differ in their easiest for natural language processing, not always in the ways that people expect. Um, but, you know, there are sort of easier languages. It turns out English is a pretty easy language and there are harder languages. And it turns out that Chinese is one of the hardest languages. So essentially, I think the biggest spectrum in which languages for our current machines are easy hard is how explicit the language is. So in a language like English, there's a lot of very explicit structure. Word order is pretty fixed. You have to say um, she saw him. Um, whereas, you know, in other languages, word order is much freer and you can drop a lot of stuff. I mean, in Chinese, you can just say saw and in context, it's obvious who saw who. Um, and so anything that requires more contextual understanding is harder for our current NLP systems. But, you know, that's a defect of our current NLP systems. Um, clearly, um, Chinese speakers have no trouble understanding each other. And what we need to be starting to do is building NLP systems that actually make substantive use of context, whereas actually most of our current NLP systems are laser focused on the words that are being spoken and make pitifully little use of context. And I actually think doing more of that, which sort of leads into ideas like grounded language learning is a really um, super good research area for the future. 
Um, very briefly on the last thing. Yeah, every now and again, people sort of suggest something that's some language, commonly it's Sanskrit or else it's Esperanto, would be the perfect clear language and we should translate everything into that and that would be a way to make progress. I, I don't think that that would actually really help um, because you know the difficult part would then be the translation and it's not really the case that there's some perfectly logical language. All languages have their weirdnesses and lacks of information in various different ways. Okay, yeah, thanks for your answer. Yeah, that's very insightful. Uh, and uh, let's thank you and let's thank Chris again for his uh, awesome talk.